Good morning, church. Welcome. It's good to see everybody here this morning. And um, I'm, my name's Ross Porter. I'm um, been my pleasure to be leading us this morning. So good to have God here with us. Um, no matter where we are um, in in our in our walk this week, it, it some of us will have will have had a good week and we'll be walking in on as, as our feet will be as light as anything. Some of the, some of our feet will be a bit heavier. And no matter where we are this week, um, we can look, lift our eyes to Jesus. We're currently in a season um, called Who- Hebrews Moving Forward in Jesus. Helen's going to come to speak to us a little bit later on on the topic of the persecuted church, and she'll pray with us for the persecuted church after that, I believe. Now, offerings, we don't take the collection anymore, as most people would know, so there's a little slot by the office if you pop your offering in there. Um, we'd be really appreciating that. And let's just pray now for the for the use of those offerings. Father God, we lift all of the offerings and resources that are, that are given to the church, whether it's money, volunteering time, other resources, Lord. We pray that those are put to good use to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, before we look into our first songs, we should stand and greet each other. And just remembering we're still coming out of a pandemic, so some people might not be quite inclined to uh, hug you as, as they were in the past. So let's just do that.
Perfect. When I was uh, preparing for this morning, I, uh, this passage came to mind. It's from 1 Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come, to, come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but re- rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Strong message, really. And and our our prayer team this morning, when they were praying for us, a word came, and this is the word, it's from Psalm 28, verse 29. By my God, I can leap over a wall. We can expect... A victory, when at least, ex- <laughs> beg your pardon, we at least expect a victory, God can empower it. So that's an inspiring one as well. So it's, it, I think it reminds me that following Jesus isn't a walk in the park, but it is comforting to know that he's walking in that park with us. Now we come. We pause for time to um, reflect how we've been living and um, confess to God things where we have done wrong or neglected to do right. I guess. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. I will confess my sins to the Lord. I will not con- conceal my wrongdoings. Let's pause for a moment and bring to mind those things that we need to the cross. God forgives and heals us. We need your healing, merciful God. Give us true repentance. Some sins are plain to us, some escape us, some we cannot face. Forgive us. Set us free to hear your word to us. Set us free to serve you. Come now to a time of prayer. And um, this morning we'd like us to lift those in our local community. And for us, our local community can be here in Blockhouse Bay or many of us come from a bit further afield. So we could pray for, for those communities which we are living and working in as well. We particularly pray for those who are suffering in mind and body. For those who are receiving support and treatment. And we pray that it will be effective and bringing healing and peace. For those who have yet to receive treatment and support, we pray that it will become available and that you, Lord, will open the pathway of restoration to health and vitality. Let's just take a moment to quietly lift those we love and those that we know in need of support to lift them to Jesus and quietly in our hearts. Father God, we lift lift these prayers to you and pray that all these people that we're praying for will receive the treatment, the care they need, the support they need, Lord, and that those around them will be be the support and, and care that they need, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. So I'm coming out to the question of the day, and it's one question. It's, I've drafted this question actually. So, um, and it's to start us thinking about how those in the persecuted church might feel. I guess. Were you picked on when you were, when you were younger? And what did it feel like? Maybe you could chat with your neighbours and just what that felt like. And maybe you you were you weren't the the, the victim, maybe you were the bully, and what did that feel like? So have a, have a wee chat, and, and I'll get some feedback in a moment. In a moment. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Tough question, I know. But has anybody got any feedback? What did it feel like? Nasty. Isolating. Humiliating. Sick. Mm, not good. Does anybody remember... Like, you know, I think I might have been a bit mean to some kids when I was younger. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> what, and, I, and, I, and I have regrets. Does anybody else have any feelings about that as well? <laughs> Dita? It's not good, is it? Yeah. Hindsight's a great thing to deal with these things, isn't it? But, yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> I, I think. Yes, more. Yeah. Okay. Now, thanks for that. Now let's move on to our readings. Today they're from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. And we'll, we'll read them all together again. So... A huge cloud of witnesses is all around us, so let us throw off everything that stands in our way. Let us throw off any sin that holds on to us so tightly, and let us keep on running the race marked out for us. Let us keep looking to Jesus. He is the one who started this journey of faith, and he is the one who completes the journey of faith. He paid no attention to the shame of the cross, he suffered there because of the joy he was looking forward to. Then he sat down at the right hand of God. He made it through these attacks by sinners 
So think about him, and you won't get tired. You won't lose hope. You struggle against sin, but you have not yet fought to the point of spilling your blood. Have you picked, forgotten the word hope? It speaks to you as a father to his children. It says, My son, think of the Lord as training as important. Do not lose hope when he corrects you. The Lord trains the ones he loves. He corrects everyone he accepts as his son. Pick up with the hard times. God uses them to train you. He is treating you as his children. What children are not trained by their parents? God trains all his children. But what if he doesn't train you? Then you are not really his children. You are not God's true sons and daughter at all. Besides, of all the fathers who trained us, we respect them for it. How much more should we be trained by the Father, Spirit, and Earth? Hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Now, Helen's going to come and speak to us, and I'm. going to pull this back for her so that she can <clears throat> Father God we give thanks for the, for the message that Helen has prepared for us this morning and pray that we may learn lots about um, the mission work overseas and that the message will be um, you know, our hearts will be open to hear the, the underlying message in, in the talk today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, good morning. Now imagine yourself and your family living in a town, uh, maybe in another country, where a whole lot of people come to your place and drive you out of your home because you're Christians. And you have to go and live in the forest. That's pretty shocking. And I think actually people here in New Zealand are very thankful we don't have persecution like that. Now Barnabas Aid is an organisation whose focus is on strengthening and encouraging the local church, especially where there is persecution. In many ways it does help. Like after a disaster, sometimes you've perhaps heard of people receiving aid, but the Christians are discriminated against and they, they are kept from receiving the aid. Well, do we have persecution here for believers? No. I think most people or everyone is very glad that we don't. But there is a but. There is actually a positive side to this topic of persecution. First of all, we heard from Matthew 5, I think it says, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. Now going on a bit more in Matthew 5, verse 44 says, Jesus goes on to say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now, and we don't think of this today, but the early church was actually birthed in persecution. That's how it spread. And think of Saul breathing out murderous threats who God turned radically around for the gospel. Whatever has come against the church in different places throughout history, the church has not been stamped out. People have, sometimes rulers have tried to stamp out the church, but it hasn't worked. It can be very difficult, as you know, to be a Christian in some places like North Korea, where Christian parents will actually try to keep their beliefs from their children so that they don't get reported at school. 
and find themselves arrested and jailed. And where else can it be difficult? Well, Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, several countries in the center of Af Africa, including Nigeria, part of Nigeria, and large parts of Central Asia. I was actually part of the local church in Uzbekistan in Central Asia for some time, regularly having my service in Russian. I didn't always understand what was being said. Uh, at the beginning, my head, I'd come home from, and my head would be spinning. It seemed my local church didn't have much trouble, but then one day we were forbidden to meet. Uh, one of the other expats decided to withdraw, but I thought, this is my church, I'll throw in my lot with them, whatever happens. It was only later I discovered I was breaking the rules of my organisation. It was decided, our church decided that they would meet out in the country. So that was really wonderful, going out, catching the metro and I, I suppose a bus and meeting out in, in the field. It seemed so special. After that, we met inside. It was once a week on a Saturday afternoon at a Korean church. They didn't have any problems um, with the government. So we would meet there. And what was funny about it was, here would be, we'd be singing praises to God and just through the wall on the other side of the road, there was a police station. After a few weeks, we were able to return to our normal place. But it sort of seemed a victorious thing, meeting together like that. Um, there were stories in the, of intimidation, especially that's for in Uzbekistan, and that would happen anywhere in Central Asia, especially in the countryside, which is more conservative, and people are much more under the scrutiny of their neighbours. Um, well, where we were, we had to be careful. It was a police state, and we had to be careful about what we said on the phone. So I was rather unhappy when my daughter, said, ringing from New Zealand or wherever she was, saying something about you going and being a missionary. That was almost like that word was almost like a swear word. We didn't we didn't want to use that word, especially when people in the local church might have used it. Um, actually, the interesting thing was. It was Muslims who were serious Muslims who were more likely to be in jail, even though it was a Muslim country, but it was moderate. And they were in jail because they were perceived as being a threat to the government. So, yes. It was fairly similar in the other stands. Now, there was Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan. Some of you have probably never heard of these places. They mostly had very strict rules about meetings. Uh, you couldn't have meetings in your home and so on. And sometimes if a few pastors wanted to get together, the only way to do it reasonably safely was to go to a tea shop and um, a tea house and meet there. I think there have been cases of people losing their homes because of an unauthorized meeting. Certainly religious literature has been confiscated. It was, could be very hard to get Bibles and um, other Christian literature. In some countries of Southeast Asia, Christians have been driven from their village and I've heard of parts of India people going to live in the forest. You'd think, what can I take? If you, especially if they were burning your house, you'd just grab what you could. And this has certainly been happening in Myanmar. I don't know whether you've, you, which used to be called Burma. Now, to be honest, one doesn't want to hear too many of these stories. They can, all at once, they can be depressing. But I'm going to put a different slant on things and talk about a book called The Insanity of God, which is also in the library, or at least it was. And this man, Nick Kripkin, not his real name, for security purposes, he conceals his true identity. Early in the book, Nick Gripkin tells of his traumatic time first in Somaliland and then in Somalia, they're close, back in the 1990s when conditions were particularly fraught. At that time, when he appeared in a truck, they were giving out aid, 
They were swarmed by terribly hungry locals. They weren't trying to grab supplies of aid, but were trying to give them their babies who were starving and they couldn't feed them. That's how bad it was. I'm not going to dwell more on his time in Somalia, which at that time was particularly dangerous, and finished with the murder, murder of four young Somali men he had, to do, had led to the Lord. Anyway, he set out, when he came back to America, he set out to learn more about the church and believers who had suffered persecution. He wanted to meet and interview them, believers who were somehow surviving and thriving in persecution. You'd think, how can, how can people possibly thrive? So he and his wife set off to the former Soviet Union as a starting point. And he made this startling discovery. The stronger the persecution, the more significant the spiritual vitality of the believers. What an amazing story he tells is a story of a man called Dmitri in the Soviet Union. He wasn't a trained pastor. He, he, he did get put in jail. First of all, he started off t teaching Bible stories to his children and then they would sing. And then more people came and joined them. And the numbers went from 25 to 50, 75, 150. Well, wow, no doubt the authorities noticed. By the way, he didn't go to church, which was a three-day walk. Can you imagine walking for three days to get to church? So in the end, he was jailed for defying the authorities. He was sent a 1,000 kilometers away and locked in a tiny cell. Now, all the other 1,500 prisoners were hardened criminals. But for 17 years, at daybreak, Dimitri would face the east and sing a heart song to God. The other prisoners would curse and jeer. The guards couldn't break him, but Dimitri remained faithful to God. In the end, he was, he was beaten yet again, and they dragged him out of his cell to be executed. But this time, all the other 1,500 prisoners, that's a whole 1,500, they stood at attention by their beds, and they raised their arms and sang the heart song that Dimitri himself had been singing. Imagine 1,500 hardened criminals singing the spiritual song to God. Well, the guards released their hold of him in terror and stepped back. Who are you? Dimitri straightened his back and was responded. I am a son of the living God and Jesus is his name. The guards couldn't carry out the ex execution. They returned him to his cell and later he was released and returned to his family. Quite an amazing story. Later on, Nick Ripkin moves on to his experience with the large group of underground of the underground church in China. Excuse me. He has a secret rendezvous with some of its leaders, who take him on an 18-hour journey most of it lying in the back of a van. Now imagine, I was just thinking, it used to, people used to work out how long does it take to drive down to Wellington? Well, if you don't stop in the way, it's eight, eight hours. So this is more than a journey of going to Wellington and back. So he had to lie down hidden from any officials. They took him to a remote place in the depths of the countryside so they could communicate with each other. And the, the leaders of this uh, underground church network of 10 million people, they had about three or 400 people who came to meet with him. So they had some interesting communications. Now, I'm just... One thing he learns that is it's quite normal to be sent to jail in China this is according to the book, which was just written a few years ago, to be sent to jail for three years for one's faith. In fact, people seem to see it as it's like going to Bible college. 
What? Crazy. It's what God does in your life in jail. And it's also a chance to lead others to the Lord so you can evangelize others there. He also noticed among Chinese believers a constant joyfulness in the middle, midst of harsh circumstances, even though they still had to act carefully. Like in Uzbekistan, we did have to act carefully. Be careful on the telephone what you say. And also, sometimes in public, you get used to looking over your shoulder to hear who around you shouldn't hear what you're going to say. In fact, one or two of these habits, and when I first came back to New Zealand, there were quite a few things I wouldn't say on the phone because I was used to being very careful. It sort of stuck with me for a while, some topics. He noticed among Chinese believers a constant joyfulness in the midst of these half circumstances. Even though they still had to act carefully, they didn't let their guard down. By contrast, when he compared them with those from the Soviet Union after who had endured decades of oppression, what they'd been through still weighed heavily on them. They hadn't got free of it. So there was a difference. Now I'm going to read one or two extracts from this book by this man, not his real name, Nick Ripkin. The first is page 262. He said, I, I had flown home from my Eastern Europe trip asking myself, is the resurrection power that the New Testament describes still real and available to believers in the world today? He said, I left China convinced that it was. I had learned of millions of Chinese believers who had found it and were living it. I heard the resurrection power in their words. I sensed it in their spirits and I had seen overwhelming evidence of it in the lives and ministry of so many people still enduring persecution all over that country. And then I'm going to go on to another little bit. Uh, he's, talking, he's talking about startling view. Chinese believers had learned something that Jesus pay, plainly taught, that persecution can actually change a person's faith. Before persecution, a person's faith might look a certain way. After persecution and suffering, however, that faith might look very different. In fact, after persecution, the believer might not even look like the same person. And interesting, the change might be a cause for celebration. And so he's comparing it to the disciples um, after they had received the, after Pentecost, the turning point between that crippling fear and this newfound courageous freedom is the resurrection of Jesus. So he said, what I, what I was hearing in the stories was this very same century, first century account of faith. Believers who experienced and endured persecution found their faith strengthened, deepened and matured. They were changed. And then there's one other little conversation. There was a, he met with another group, a, a network of um, people who'd suffered persecution, because I think the, then there were about two networks. So this is what he recounts as a, 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 a sort of an imaginary conversation. By the end of my time in China, my understanding had grown. And then he asked... I asked when, where, whether, when and how the oppressed could truly threaten a totalitarian oppressor. They offered this scenario in response. These are the questions. Right. The security police might regularly harass a believer who owns a property where a house church meets. The police say, you've got to stop these meetings. If you do not stop these meetings, we will confiscate your house and we will throw you out into the street. Then the property owner will probably respond, do you want my house? Do you want my farm? 
Well, if you do, then you need to talk to Jesus because I gave the property to him. The security police won't know what to make of that answer, so they will say, we don't have any way to get to Jesus, but we can certainly get to you. When we take your property, you and your family will have nowhere to live. And the house church believers will declare, then we will be free to trust God for shelter as well for our, as for our daily bread. If you keep this up, we will beat you, persecutors will tell them. Then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing, the believers will respond. And then we will put you in prison, the police will threaten. By now the response is almost predictable. Then we will be free to preach the good news of Jesus to the captives to set them free. We'll be, we'll be free to plant church, churches in prison. If you do that, we will kill you, the frustrated authorities will vow. And with utter consistency, the house church believers will reply, then we will be free to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. It's not a conversation you'd expect in New Zealand. So um, we're going to pray, pray for the persecuted church. Lord, we have been challenged by what we have heard about our brothers and sisters in other places. Help us to learn from them, to be bold for you and not afraid to take a stand for what we believe. Lord, we know that we can trust you to help us. And thank you so much for all that our faith means to us. Give us eyes to see those that you would have us share our faith with. And Lord, we do want to lift up our brothers and sisters who are going through some very difficult things. Some of those have had family members who have been killed because, because of their faith. And Father, we just hold up these people who are going through mourning because they've lost loved ones like that. And Lord, we pray, help us to remember them and we pray that you will specially strengthen those in jail because of you and those going through severe trials. Help them not to deny you, but be aware of your love and presence. Lord, we lift up this prayer to you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Thanks, Helen. Here in New Zealand, we, we really have no idea, you know, in the land of milk and honey, we, we do have an idea, but it's, it's really hard to imagine how difficult it is for those who um, are pers persecuted around the world. And I do encourage you to uphold all of these um, places that having having much more difficult to, 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 to hold true to your faith and, 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 and yes, I'll just encourage that. We're going to sing now um, our next song, which is Have Faith in God. Uh, so please, please stand up and...
gather around the th great Thanksgiving and the bread and the wine, can I invite us on this day where we have been reflecting on the persecuted church throughout the world that we would draw them together as the family of God in the communion. So let's just think of places that may be on your heart or your mind or areas that have been stimulated through some of the things Helen shared this morning. And let's draw them into communion with us as one people in God. So we come to this great Thanksgiving. I invite you to make the responses. Let's think about the words as we say them. Christ is risen. He is risen Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. It is the joy of our salvation, God of the universe, to give you thanks through Jesus Christ. You said, let there be light. There was light. Your light shines on in our darkness. For you, the earth has brought forth life in all its forms. You have created us to hear your word, to do your will, and to be fulfilled in your love. It is right to thank you. You sent your Son to be for us the way we need to follow and the truth we need to know. You sent your Son to give his life, to release us from our sin. His cross has taken our guilt away. You send your Holy Spirit to strengthen, to guide, to warn, and to revive your church. Therefore, with all your witnesses who surround us on every side, countless as heaven stars, we praise you, for our creation and our calling with loving and with joyful hearts. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and just, glory and goodness come from you. Glory to you, most high and gracious God. I invite you to sit as we continue in our prayers. Blessed are you, most holy God. We remember your son as he washed his disciples' feet. I'm among you, Jesus said, as one who serves. Then on that night before he died, he took bread, gave you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it to them and said, drink this. It is my blood of the new covenant shed for you, shed for all, do this to remember me. Therefore, God of the past and present, with this bread and wine we remember your Son. We thank you for his coming in glory, and in him we give ourselves to you. Through your Holy Spirit, may we who receive Christ's body be indeed the body of Christ. May we who share this cup draw strength from the one true vine. Called to follow Christ, Help us to reconcile and unite. Call to suffer. Give us hope in our calling. And so we gather our prayers as we say together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the chest, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ's body was broken for us on the cross. His blood was shed for our forgiveness. So come, God's people, come to receive Christ's heavenly provision. For anyone who's visiting us today, a very warm invitation, which I add uh, to Ross's this morning, uh, a warm invitation to come to receive the bread and the wine, uh, or if you would like, would prefer a blessing instead, if you could just place your hand by your side, so I know you're not asking for the sacrament, but if you would like prayer as well as the sacrament, if you could just place your hand on your heart, and I will pray with you, and there'll be others who will pray with you also. So come God's people.
This is communion. Your body broken, the cup we're drinking is bittersweet. The gift of friendship, truest salvation, born of your son. This is communion. Take it as often as you may. For His blood has power still. By His wounds we shall be healed. This is communion. Take up the bread, receive. This is communion. Take it as often as you will. For his blood has power still. By his wounds we shall be healed. This is communion.
So blessed be God who has called us together. Blessed be God who has forgiven our sin. Blessed be God whose word is proclaimed. Therefore we offer you all that we are and all that we shall become. Just before the final blessing this morning, I, we do have a copy for each of you of, from Barnabas A, so you can read a little bit more about what Helen was talking about this morning. So do make sure you get your copy as you leave today. And so the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you. Good morning, people, again, and a warm welcome to those who are joining us on, uh, online. I omitted to welcome you earlier in the service, so good to, good to have you with us. Um, some notices this morning. Thank you to those that supported the book launch last week. Uh, more copies of the book, um, My Help Comes from the Lord, are available on Amazon. Do we have any more here? Poetry readers, 
for a new theme on, on our, I think on our social media, we're going to have people reading out poetry. So if you um, see that as one of your talents, Claire would love to hear from you. And, and, so, and upcoming events this year, we have the Festival of Blockhouse Bay on the 3rd of December and the Combined Churches Party down at Craigavon Park on the 10th of December. There's going to be some sign-up sheets out here now, so if you would, wouldn't mind popping your name on one of those sheets with a job that you would like to do or some, some task that you would be able to uh, pitch in and help out with, that would be much appreciated. Um, and now let's all stand for our final song, And Can It Be?
And just before I, uh, with the dismissal, I'd just like to pass on a big thank you to Colleen, Warwick, Dieter and Margaret for leading us in worship this morning. It's been great. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing more to be said other than go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Please join us for a coffee or tea in the lounge. Might be a biscuit there too. I'd love to have a chat.
Testing. Okay. Testing. Testing. Testing.